Hey, greetings. My name is Michael Schmidt. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, and I've uh, been teaching in this program for several years. And I was talking to some of you. I know that you've been, uh, some of you are early in the program, and some are probably almost finished with the program. So uh, welcome. Uh, our session today is really going to focus on clinical features of unexplained fatigue. And I think to, uh, to lay out uh, this platform, I really want to say a little bit more about how I come to this subject because it might give some insight into why I'm going to take it the direction that I take it and how that applies to the clinical environment. So first of all, I want to say we're going to go over a lot of fairly elaborate and detailed information over the course of the day. And I'm going to suggest that you don't worry about memorizing it or tracking every single detail because there's really a single concept that I would like to get to throughout the morning. And I'll highlight that as we continue to go on through all the material. But to say a little bit about how I come to the subject, um, I'm a principal investigator at NASA Ames Research Center, and I work with the uh, Space Biotechnology research branch and the human factors area. So this is with the astronaut medical corps and the chief medical officer. And so one of the things that we do there is work on extreme environments, whether that's deep space type conditions or long duration missions and all the physiologic demands that go along with that. The goal of that then also is to translate all of that understanding from those complex environments to human medicine. And so we also all work in that group in a human clinical environment with disease state management. So it's very much translational, but we use the know-how that we get from some of these extreme situations to help us understand much more about what's happening in disease state conditions. And so up here you'll see is the, uh, I don't know if this little pointer works or not, not that, oops, is the NASA 20G centrifuge. So that's where humans reside and um, Typically, it never has taken up to 20 Gs, but that's what it will do. And so, for example, in one study, we used to, we did 24-hour continuous centrifugation to look at human tolerance in that extreme condition. Uh, we are also collaborating with the Stanford Human Performance Laboratory, and so in that group, we are looking at uh, essentially elite athletes, elite performers, Olympic performers, and we also work with the. Uh, Corvette Racing uh, Driver Physiology Program, which is basically uh, the Le Mans type race where drivers are going for shifts of two hours and then over a period of a total of 24 hours. So these are really extreme conditions where fatigue comes in to play uh, very distinctly and in some very unique ways. Some of it is, of, is pure physical or peripheral fatigue. Some of it is very much central fatigue. And what we've begun to understand about this is the importance of uh, availability of brain resources and utilization of brain resources and then provision of brain resources as part of the fatigue complex, but also we have all of the peripheral needs that come into play. So as we think about fatigue, those are some of the key points, peripheral versus central. And what are the metabolic, metabolic elements of fatigue in those situations? So as I said, we, we take those understandings from these extreme environments and then apply those to the clinical environments, whether that be diabetic-associated fatigue, cancer-associated fatigue, or really one of the more difficult clinical conundrums, is, as you well know, is fatigue of unexplained origin. So we don't have a classical diagnosis on which we can pin the fatigue or the exhaustion or the poor exercise tolerance. And now where do we start? And so what I really want to do is focus on that unexplained fatigue. And so as you probably know, fatigue is the second most uh, encountered complaint in primary care. These are some of the common descriptive terms, and we'll move fairly quickly through this uh, before we get into some of the very detailed depth of the subject. So you're familiar with all of these common complaints, fatigue, tiredness, weakness, exhaustion, drowsiness, dizziness. Asthenia is a word we use. Of course, patients don't use that word. Uh, Piper breaks it down this way, into behavioral, which is interference with normal activities, affective, so how fatigue is described, sensory, those are the feelings associated with fatigue, and then cognitive, which are mood, memory, and thinking components. So these are the typical labels uh, that we associate with fatigue, chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, unexplained fatigue, myalgic encephalomyelitis, fibromyalgia, 
excessive daytime sleepiness. These are descriptors. Some of them are diagnoses. What we really want to do is start to step outside of the box somewhat and start to look at fatigue as a phenomenon because the labels are evolving and we see many, many different heterogeneous complaints that are linked to fatigue. So let's look at some of the differential diagnoses because these are the things we all know about, but I, I want to illustrate those just very briefly before we move into the core of this. And that is, so obviously there are endocrine disorders that have to be considered in fatigue. So these would be the first clinical components that we would want to rule in or rule out, those being thyroid disease, pituitary, hypothalamic, adrenal, uh, diabetes and obesity being among those that we would call in the category of endocrine diseases. Then we have to rule in and rule out infectious diseases like viral, bacterial, fungal, and parasitic. Then there's a whole range of psychiatric and neurological diseases of which there are just you know, a few listed here. But these are the categories of disease that we have to rule in and rule out uh, before we go on to a different approach to the fatigue condition. So one of the things I want to raise is this question of what is the diagnosis? And I want to change our thinking, at least for discussion's sake, to is this the right question? In other words, is the diagnosis important or does it constrain us in some way? So often we have a diagnostic category and we're treating the diagnosis. But we could use a, a couple of examples. That We have a case a pool of about 50 patients uh, with fatigue right now, and their metabolic panels are all drastically different. And these are cases of unexplained fatigue. And so if we look at a metabolic panel of 150 to 200 analytes, they're all very different and very unique. So the, so the phenotype is fatigue, and the metabotype, if you will, is, is very distinct. So the fatigue looks similar, and the metabolic profile looks very unique. So this question of does the patient have chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, fibromyalgia, whatever we want to put in there, that's a classic diagnosis, is that the most important question? It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. But I want to start thinking about this in a little bit of a broader sense. So is there another set of questions? Is there a common path? So one way to approach fatigue then, uh, unique among clinical presentations, is that what are the collective forces that have come to bear upon energy metabolism? Because one of the first things to fail in any disease state is energy metabolism. And especially if we look at the resources that the brain requires, which is about 20 to 25 percent of oxygen and circulatory supply, one of the first places that we see fatigue manifest is central or cognitive or emotional processes. So then we ask the question, what are the inputs, intermediates, and outputs? And these I'm really looking specifically uh, at metabolic or dietary or nutritional, but we can really look at any kind of an input and an intermediate and an output. And those are some of the things that we want to talk about today in a very specific way to understand then how to, in a, in a targeted manner, manage the patient with unexplained fatigue. So how do we assess those inputs and outputs regardless of the label or the diagnosis? So to illustrate that, I want to describe one case that we had about uh, eight years ago who was a young man who was a distance runner with severe unexplained fatigue, had been through, through UCLA, he had been through UCSF, and he had gone from running about 10 miles a day to the point where he could only get around the track by walking one time. And so we did a metabolic panel that consisted of about 300 analytes, and on that metabolic panel there were 37 uh, that we would, 37 markers that we would consider either outside the reference range where there was one or in the first or fifth quintile, meaning at one extreme or the other, for analytes that did not have a reference range. And among these were actually some fairly common metabolites. So we had very, very high methylmalonic acids. So we know that he had a, a, a B12 deficiency, severe fatty acid abnormalities, severe amino acid deficiencies, and he had an uh, intestinal infection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point being there, the phenotype was fatigue, but there were so many metabolic markers that are outside normal ranges. And 
so the approach that we used was to treat the metabolic profile and to treat the system rather than treat the diagnosis.